Disclaimer. Judge Ron Rangel is providing this podcast and website for educational purposes only, as well as to give the public general information regarding topics related to the criminal justice system. The views, thoughts, and opinions of his guest speakers are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Judge Rangel. All rise. You are now listening to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Rangel, educating the public and expanding mindsets. Subscribe on our website, beyondthegavelpodcast.com, or your favorite podcast platform for more of the latest podcast episodes and updates. Welcome to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Rangel. I am your host. Today we have someone special with us, Monica Guerrero. Welcome, Monica. Good afternoon, Judge. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Why don't you tell our listeners who you are? Well, my name is Monica Guerrero, and I have been an attorney now for 28 years. I was a prosecutor initially when I started my legal career. In the 290th? I I was county court 7, county court 4, county court 2, 5, and then I went to juvenile, and then I went to the 290th. And then from there... I was also in the 186, and I went back to juvenile, and then, as fortune would have it, I was elected in 2002 to be the judge of county court number seven. I stayed there until I lost my election in 2010, and I've been a practicing attorney since then, focusing mostly on criminal, juvenile, and family law matters. You're experienced. How long were you a prosecutor? I was a prosecutor for eight years. I always kind of joke around that I worked at HEB for eight years, (laughs) then I worked as a prosecutor for eight years, and then I was a judge for eight years, and I have broken my record being an independent attorney for longer than eight years. This is the longest job you've ever had. This really is, and I have not fired myself. Stability. Yes. You must make yourself happy. Well, I don't know how I can characterize that. (laughs) If 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 you recall, Um, And I just brought it up to you because it just struck me just a moment ago. When I was first sworn in, um, January the 1st of 2009, we call that an investiture, right? Yes. That's where you get your robe, you give little speeches. It's sort of a little bit of pomp and circumstance. You gave me the honor of providing a little speech on my behalf at my investiture. And it was extremely an honor to be able to do that. So we had a question a couple of shows back. I believe it was episode four with Scott Simpson. That's a plug. Somebody was asking specifically about jury selection and how it worked. And since you've seen it from all three positions, I thought you would be a great person to bring in and have this discussion with. Um, So you remember back in March of 2020 when COVID hit. Yes. I was responsible with my administrative duties um, to figure out how to handle the public safety within the courthouse buildings. And so I suspended in-person jury trials. Now, what, in your opinion, um, would be the result of suspending in-person jury trials on the criminal justice system? You know, it depends on what side that you're on and how you would answer this question. As a practitioner with an elderly mom and people who have responsibilities to others, it made complete sense that safety was paramount and the decision of the court and you having the moxie, so to speak, to say, you know, we're going to suspend these things and everybody is going to do things remotely was very beneficial to protect, again, my family and everybody's help. There were certain defendants in jail that were very upset in having to be incarcerated longer. The majority of people that were in fact incarcerated for an extended period of time had the more egregious type cases. The jail, upon orders of the court, were doing everything that they could to release inmates that were low-level risk offenders and cases that could essentially be deemed that were not as risky as somebody who maybe had murder or something aggravated. Um, I was very pleased also that the judges responded quickly to be able to still have hearings remotely. So again, a lower level offender was able to get justice, even though we had lockdowns, people were able to do Zoom remotely in the civil courts, the criminal courts, and the juvenile courts to still be able to move the cases. So I do applaud your efforts, as well as the efforts of your colleagues and the rest of the judiciary that supported the decision to keep people safe. 
you bring up some really good points as it relates to how we were able to use technology. Now, I do got to give it to my colleagues because technology speaking, I'm not very fluent. But a lot of my colleagues jumped on board very quickly and realized the necessity of developing Zoom, um, which then allowed me to focus on procedures on how we were going to proceed with having in-person hearings in a way to maintain that public safety. Part of that is we started doing jury selection and, and jury qualifications virtually over Zoom. Do you recall that? I do. do. What were your thoughts in terms of how we were handling it within the judiciary, um, in terms of calling in juries, having them report online? Because what would happen is a summons would go out. They would get the summons. They would report online by putting in their information. Um, once we had that information, then we would give them directions on how to report. A judge would come in. We got. We ended up getting, um, which we still utilize today, um, Zoom credentials for up to 500 individuals in a particular Zoom meeting. So they come online, we explain the process to them, and then we give them instructions on where to report to exactly to do their jury service. Did you ever have any opportunities to take part in that or see how that worked? I did. My brother-in-law, my sister, and I believe my mom all got summoned during the qualifications on Zoom. And we were the only jurisdiction in Texas that actually were doing Zoom qualifications. Um, and we've gotten calls from all over the country asking us how we do that because folks are interested in still doing that. Although lately there has been a push to go back into the courtroom. Um, so let's get past all that. Let's say you're an attorney now because now you're a defense attorney. But I, wanna, I want you to think with all three hats. You see a panel in the hallway you know that your client wants a jury trial. You know that the state wants a jury trial. And the way the system works is both sides have a right to have a jury trial unless there's an agreement, right? Correct. Unless there's a plea bargain agreement. So you're an attorney. You're handed the list of folks that are going to be on that panel. And in criminal district court, we have 75 people per panel. What do you do? What are your thoughts? Well, going back to the prequalification that you discussed, the idea that you were able to pre-qualify people before they drove downtown had to deal with the massive amounts of construction that have occurred during and before COVID. Had to come in here, try to figure out where they're going to park, have to get their ticket stamped, have to stand in line to talk to a judge just to tell them, I'm 80 years old, I cannot speak English correctly or well, and or I have some type of a disability in being able to hear. All of those things were easily remedied by this qualification online. It, it also helped people that were parents that were either taking care of older adults or taking care of young children that didn't have the resources to have childcare or someone to take care of their children just so they could be here for a few hours. So the pre-qualification, I don't think really affected the panels because those people would have been knocked out, so to speak, using the legal jargon that people use, that they're kicked off of the jury because they have an exemption. So doing it by Zoom, really, it, it, it also saved the taxpayers dollars because they didn't have to pay the $6 and they didn't have to pay for parking in the parking garage. Right. So it was very innovative. And again, I, I, I commend you also for having the wisdom to understand that even if your strong suit isn't technology, that you found somebody that was strong in technology to assist you in getting that implemented. Thank you. Um, you're talking about taxpayer savings. One of the things that people that would get summoned that would come out on Zoom complain about is, why didn't I get my $6? Like, let's say they were summoned, they came online, they said, because remember, qualifications mean you're able to read and write English, you're eligible to vote, you are a citizen of the United States, uh, you're over the age of 18, um, you don't have a pending felony case or a misdemeanor theft, or you don't have a conviction for a felony or misdemeanor theft. So those folks would come in, they would they would get paid the $6 from the county, they would spend half a day here just to get in line to say, I'm not even qualified to be on this jury, I don't reside in Bear County, whatever the case is, we don't have to pay them because the statute says that people get paid that $6 not as a stipend, but as a reimbursement for having to travel and pay parking or other associated fees with coming into the courthouse. So removing that saved a lot of taxpayer dollars. And so understanding all of those things, when we started 
the actual panel coming into the courtroom process, we knew that all the folks that had qualification issues or wanted to exercise exemptions, like being over the age of 70, uh, like being in high school, being a, a college student, um, you know, ca caring for somebody who's invalid, caring for children under the age of 12 and not having anybody to leave them with, all of those things and that help people or all those things that people can use to exempt themselves from jury service now can be done before they come in. So the 75 folks that come into the courtroom on a panel have already been pre-qualified. So we know now that we got plenty of folks that are coming in and we don't have to waste any time dealing with those individuals, right? That's correct. And it used to be that if the judge was presiding that month, it would take a long time for them to go through all of the qualifications. And now the process of going through jury selection is actually much quicker. Let's go back to what you think about folks coming into the courtroom now. you got 75 people. You're handed a list. I've had attorneys complain and say, um, it's not really fair, right? i got to go through this list. People are coming in. It's 75 people. What exactly is on that On that informational sheet that people have to fill out that the attorneys get to look at. What do you think about the fact that you don't know who is going to be on your panel until the moment before they walk into that courtroom? There's a couple of things that you've brought up. In some smaller counties, because they have to draw a panel ahead of time, they do give the attorneys a list ahead of time. And you can actually get your investigator or somebody that, you know, works in your office to verify, yes, this person lives in the county. Yes, this person, you know, has not been in any trouble. Or, oh, my God, look at this person. They have like 10 felonies pending. How did they make the jury? That's in the small counties. That's the advantage that you get from getting the list ahead of time. Yes. In a large county like Bear, you kind of have to roll with the punches. Yes. And it's an interesting system because in this courthouse, every judge does things their own way. Whether it's misdemeanor courts, we use the same panels for juvenile. We use the same panels for county court. We use the same panels for municipal court. So you have to roll with the punches because if you don't, you're going to be really well and tight trying to figure out what am I going to do because I don't know any of the people on the list and I don't know what this judge is going to do. I don't need to explain this rule to you, but it was on my bar exam in 1994. <laughs> How many times can you shuffle the jury? Right. The answer was one. And I, I got that right on my test. So yay for me. The judge that I'm talking about says, I'm not going to give you the list yet. I need you to look and eyeball, those are the words that he uses, I want you to look and eyeball the jury before you decide if you want to shuffle. So you have absolutely no information about them, nothing, not their names, nothing about where they work, where they live, etc. You just are supposed to eyeball them and make a decision whether or not you want to shuffle. So let's explain what a shuffle is. I would say that it's almost like the numbers that are coming out in the lottery. Right. When you get on the jury panel, they put numbers and you might be number 100, and yet you get to be number two on the list. It's like now you're in danger of being picked because those first 32 people are looking real good. All right. So that's a good point. 32 people per jury panel that we have to qualify in order to seat a jury. Correct. How is it that we arrive at that number, do you think? So we need 12. The 12 for sure that are going to be our jurors. And we're talking about criminal district courts. Yes. Because all, all district courts require 12 jurors to be on a panel. Correct. County courts of law require six. Correct. All right. So if you need 12 people to be on a district court panel, then the other 10 individuals are for what we refer to as peremptory strikes. Yes. A big word for saying, I really just don't like this person. They're looking at me weird or... They, I can tell they just don't like me, so we better take that person and send them home. So out of those 32 people, you could pick 10 people that you want for any reason whatsoever and strike them and remove them except for racial bias. Or, Correct. Or except so, for racial purposes. Which, which they call a Batson challenge. That's so exactly. yes, you can't just go and strike 10 people and say, I, I, I just don't like people from Mars. They're all green and I don't like green people. <laughs> That makes sense. And so um, then if you got to qualify 32 people, that means the first 32 people that can be free of bias, that can follow the law, that can listen to the type of case that you have with an open mind, those 32 people are very important because that is where your strikes will extend to. 
Correct. And then if you have alternates, like we do very often now with COVID, considering the fact that somebody could go home and end up with COVID in the middle of trial, and you got to bring in an alternate to substitute, let's say you have two alternates, you need five additional people past that 32 number, right? Correct. So now you're looking at 40 people that you got to qualify. At least. So why would then a shuffle be significant? Well, let's just pretend for argument's sake that you're in a, de a defense attorney that believes that no law enforcement could ever be fair to you. I, I don't believe in that because I have had police officers stay on my jury panels. Uh, a couple of trials ago, I had an attorney. So I've had people that are in the law enforcement profession that can sit on my jury. I just need somebody that's just going to listen. Right. But there are some people that are like, oh, my God, there's a parole officer on here. There's a probation officer on here. There's a border patrol guy. Yeah. There's SAPD. And oh, my gosh, there's even a fireman. And what if he's friends with the SAPD? So they want to shuffle, and hopefully, out of the first 32, those people go to the back, and they're closer to the 75. So then the, the 75 people that come in, they're put at numbers. And so after everybody exercises their strikes, the first 12 people that are eligible and available become on that jury. Correct. Or become members of that jury. Yes. And then so a shuffle means you basically take all those 75 folks, you put them back into the computer, and you just re-randomize the order that they come out. Correct. Got just, it. just like the lotto. And so on occasion, uh, you may get, as a defense attorney or even as a prosecutor, you may get a better jury available to you as it relates to the numbers, right? Or you could actually end up in a worse position. You don't know. That is true, but there's never a guarantee of who you're going to get. Some people... You read articles and you go to all these continuing legal education seminars and they're like, whatever you do, don't put the dog catcher on there because the dog catcher <laughs> believes that everybody bites. <laughs> you know, it's it just everybody has a theory. Everybody yeah. has a theory on to who is going to be a good juror and who isn't. So I can't necessarily say, based on my perspective, if I'm going to get a better jury or a worse jury because we put them back in the pool and then all of a sudden they come out of the lottery system Instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, they came in 75, 72, 31, et cetera. Right. So somebody has a, somebody is at the end of that 75 uh, mark, like let's say that they're in their 70s, then those people have much less of a chance to be on that jury than the first 32. Yes. And I do encourage them to go buy a lotto ticket because they were probably in the front and then they went to the back. It's like, now you got really lucky. You got out of it. Nothing wrong with that. Um, although I did speak to a jury panel today and I told them what I tell all jury panels is at the end of every jury trial, I do speak to those that made it on the jury and we get to sort of talk about their experiences and they always feel that the educational experience alone means so much to them, that they got so much out of it that it really made them feel positive about what they got in the system. It made them feel things were fair and there was a process and it made them feel like they were a part of something important. All right, let's go ahead and do a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Q&A with Judge Ron Rangel. Submit your question today at beyondthegavelpodcast.com. I'm here talking to Monica Gadetto. We got a question from Thomas, and I'm going to read this question to you. Can jurors go home during the weekend if deliberations are still taking place? Answer, no. And it depends. I shouldn't say directly no. If a party has asked that the jury be sequestered, which is they have to stay together and go to a hotel with no phones, no television, no computers, no access to the public, then they do have to stay together until they come to a verdict. But I have found that sequestering people on a Friday afternoon has been very influential in getting jurors to come to a decision. So the default is jurors cannot go home. If they are sequestered. Well, they can't go home unless both parties agree. Correct. To allow them to go home. Right. And so what are some of the things that you think about in considering whether or not you want to agree that parties can go home? On the defense side, a lot of times it is, let's pretend I'm trying an intoxication manslaughter. And if they go home tonight and it's Friday night and it's Fiesta week and then they read in the paper, oh, so there was 20 
intoxication manslaughters tonight. It's a record number, etc. It may actually influence one of the jurors' decisions if they see that on television and come back and decide, you know what, there were 20 last night. I'm not going to let this guy get away with it. Right. But as a prosecutor, it's also kind of the same thing in that when I would go, when they would go home, I would be worried, are they going to go and start Googling things mm -hmm. and, you know, find out that this person was, you know, the most revered past pastor's best friend at my church and they were such a great guy and they just had a little bit too much communal wine that night and they just made an error and there, but for the grace of God, go I. Excellent. And so, and so before you allow those jurors to break um, and go home for whatever the night is, uh, whatever length of time that is, a judge really should instruct them and say, we're going to let you break. We're going to let you go home, but I'm instructing you, don't look up any information online. Don't look up any names. Don't drive to any locations that you may have heard about. Don't look up any legal terms. There was a case not too long ago. She had a jury that was deliberating. One of them went home, looked up the definition of proof beyond a reasonable doubt online, came back to the jury, told them, this is what I read proof beyond a reasonable doubt means, which is an actually inaccurate definition. And as a result of that, she had to pronounce the trial as a mistrial. So the entire murder case had to be retried. And so even looking up the law could be a dangerous circumstance. Um, you also don't want anybody to talk to family or friends or anybody else who may be influential in having them make a decision because you're not allowed to get outside influence when you make these kinds of calls. Thomas, thank you so much for your question. This is Q&A with Judge Ron Rangel. Submit your question today at beyondthegavelpodcast.com. Welcome back. I'm here talking with our guest, Monica Gadetto. So what are some of the things that you look at with your experience when you get a panel that comes in? Like, let's say, and I'll just give you an example. Let's say you have somebody charged with an aggravated sexual assault of a child, and you, you are known and respected for handling the kind of cases that you handle, because you handle a lot of the big cases, the kind of cases that a lot of attorneys don't want. So knowing that, let's say you're handling one of those kinds of cases, an unsavory type of charge. What are some of the things that you look for in a juror? Well, I will tell you, as a general rule, when the jurors hear from the judge that this is a type of charge that they're going to have to sit and decide on, Usually their body language tenses up. They're looking at their watch and they're trying to figure out what can I say not to be on this jury. Right. Or they're looking at the defendant and thinking, what did that guy do and why am I sitting here? It's a difficult thing to kind of describe because I, I don't really know what exactly I'm looking for because every panel is different. Mm -hmm. I will tell you that I'm, I'm looking for people that are not automatically shut off. I know that a lot of young attorneys, they love to use PowerPoint, again, going back to technology, because it reminds them of the points that they need to cover, especially in the DA's office, because they have the burden of proof. So they set out the elements to be able to explain it to a jury, and it makes sense. However, if you are a sole practitioner and you don't have anybody assisting you, going through a PowerPoint may not allow you to see people's facial expressions, body language or even listen to people. So when you start talking to people, the minute they hear the words, oh, well, you're going to be here for the next week listening to an aggravated sexual assault of a child and continuous sex abuse, I would like to see the people that are crossing their arms, crossing their legs, making a face, or looking at the defendant as though he is the devil incarnate. <laughs> and I won't be able to do that if, if I'm looking at my PowerPoint and not paying attention to what people are doing and, and are going to say to me. You bring up some really good points. So one of the things that you're talking about is related to whether people can be fair, right? And so if they're looking at your client in a way that this person did something wrong, then the question becomes, can they be fair to your particular client? So let's say you have a sense that somebody's not fair. People that don't have the ability to follow the law can't be on a jury, is right? And so let, let me explain how this works real quick. So let's say a jury panel comes in 
I, as a judge, always give them general principles related to the Constitution as to what it takes to be able to be on that jury. The first thing is you got to be able to look at this defendant, this person accused of a crime, and think that they deserve the presumption of innocence that everybody deserves charged with any kind of a crime. So the presumption of innocence means they cannot in any way have it in their mind and and uh, and follow that thought process as they go through the trial and as they go through the deliberations that this person is guilty of something simply by virtue of the fact that they sit there accused of a crime. So let's say somebody tells you, regardless of what the judge tells me, the fact that this person is sitting here today tells me they did something wrong, right? How would you challenge that particular person and get them off the jury without having to use one of your 10 strikes that we referred to earlier as peremptory strikes? Well, and again, I'm not sure that, that that's the right time to do that. Because again, it is not just with the sex cases, although I have seen it more prevalent with the sex cases that people tense up and don't want to be on it on the jury. But even cases like the last case I tried in December, solicitation of capital murder. You know, you're talking about murder for hire. Mm -hmm. And although some people were curious, other people were like, oh, I don't want to be on that. That that just sounds terrible. It's right before Christmas. My kids have a school pageant. I've got to get out in Christmas shop. Who's going to go buy the ham for the family? What if this case lasts two weeks? And that may be the reason that they were tensing up, not that they weren't going to be fair, but that they had other things on their mind because of the time of year that we were trying this case. Right. So I don't want to necessarily kind of pigeonhole people into, okay, well, now we talked about a sex case. You just rolled your eyes and you just crossed your arms. And you're just thinking, in my mind, if I run and jump to conclusions saying, oh, this person hates my client, as opposed to, man, I've got tickets to go to Vegas next weekend. I really don't want to be here this long. Right. So it's going to take a little bit more of inquiry, I think, to get, to the point where you start figuring out what is the real reason. So what happens if somebody says, I'm supposed to go someplace fancy. I got non-refundable tickets. There's no way I can get my money back on these tickets. Or I got a surgery that's coming up. Or I got a family member that's got a medical procedure. Is that enough to get them off the jury? It is not. That's surprising to people, I bet. It really is. And a lot of people that are self-employed are very irked with that rule because if they don't work, they don't eat. And it's really surprising to them that a system that would that would require them to miss work and potentially lose some jobs is is interfering with their lifestyle and, and their ability to support their family. However, they don't call it jury duty because it's jury volunteerism. It is your duty as a citizen to come in and give a fellow citizen a right to a fair trial. But if they say something like I have my own practice. I got my own business. I got these other things going on. I'm going to be so focused on what I got to do. There's no way I can pay attention during this trial. I'm going to be so worried about paying my employees that, frankly, I just don't think I can be fair. Well, it's a good thing we have the judges to make that decision. That's that's a tough call. It is. Because then, then you really have to determine, are they just saying that to get out of jury service? Or do they truly not have the ability to focus, listen, pay attention, and do what's fair. We swear them in when we do the panel selection and when we do the qualification instruction to the juries on Zoom now, uh, which used to be the big jury room downstairs, we swear them in to tell the truth, right? And so as long as they're honest with their answers, then we know that we can proceed because they're sworn. But what happens when, as some attorneys complain, how do you know when somebody is not telling you the truth? You don't. And so what would happen later if it turns out maybe somebody did have an issue that wouldn't quite make them fair on a particular type of case, and they ended up on that jury? And you asked the questions. When I was a young prosecutor, not that young, but still some, young. somewhat young as a prosecutor, You're still young. I tried a drug case, and it ended up with a hung jury 11 to 1 for guilty. The one holdout did not tell us that she believed in legalizing all drugs, including heroin, methamphetamine, and cocaine, and she felt that they should be available just like milk and eggs at HEB, uh -huh. and that our epidemic with drugs or our war on drugs at the time could be solved by just legalizing every single drug. Has she told us that at the inception when we were talking in jury selection, hey, is there anything here we probably should know? She might have been able to go home, but... 
um, unfortunately, the case had to be retried, and uh, it came to a, a, a verdict the next time, and the person ended up getting found guilty. But at the time, if she just would have been more honest, we would have been able to just let her go and and just bring somebody else in. How was it that y'all figured out that this that this lady was was um, not in favor of drugs being a crime? She told us after the fact. Ah, uh, okay. So you went in there afterwards and you talked to the jury, and she said, "This is how I feel." Correct. I got you. I I really enjoy seeing you in the court because I still think about the days when you were a judge and you were very welcoming. Um, to all the attorneys that went in there, I always felt comfortable going in there and making sure I represented my client well. What do you think is the best part of being a criminal defense attorney in Bear County is? I do like the fact that I can go to various courts, mm -hmm. see various different styles, um, help people. I know that a lot of people that come from the district attorney's office would think, how could you ever sit there and, and defend a criminal? Mm -hmm. And again, the person's presumed innocent before they're actually found guilty. And I look at it almost the same as when I was in the district attorney's office. Mm -hmm. In the district attorney's office, I was helping complainants, sometimes called victims, depending on your vernacular. But in this case, sometimes I'm representing a person who's accused and sometimes it's false. Mm -hmm. Or it may be the person that for five seconds, they just made a mistake. Had they just decided to call Uber, they may not have been caught driving drunk. Or if they just had left earlier when their friends told them, hey, guy, you're getting you're getting wasted and I can see that you want to start a fight. If they had just left when their friends said, let's leave, then nothing might have happened. But you get to the point where it's somebody who ordinarily would never have been in trouble is in trouble and you can kind of help them get to the other side, whether it's through negotiating a plea agreement or going to trial things like that, that you can just really help to facilitate change and to help people. We have very um, similar experiences as it relates to leaving the DA's office. When I was a prosecutor and I left the district attorney's office, I told my boss at that time, or the first assistant, a guy named Homer Vasquez, that's a shout out, who was a great first assistant DA. I told him, I can't see myself representing people that are accused of crimes. And he laughed put his arm around me and he said, Ron, you do the exact same thing. And to, to segue on that, when I was a judge, Judge Ron Ronghell came in and was defending a citizen who was accused of an assault causing bodily injury to a spousal member. And Judge Ronghell did an excellent job in selecting a jury because you were very charismatic and everybody wanted to talk to you. You selected six jurors from Bear County that listened to your case as well as a district attorney's case. You put your client on the stand who was incredibly credible yes. and you got a big not guilty. And I could see the relief on your client's face as he cried when he hugged you. I remember that. He had a, a, a maroon shirt on. And I remember that he was very clean cut and he was really appreciative of the efforts that you made. And, and I do remember that. And I do remember um, having that trial and I do remember having the ability to try that case in a way that was very fair, very open to both sides. Um, the district attorney's office had prosecutors that did a really good job. They worked really, really hard. And I think as long as you have a good defense attorney working hard and a good prosecutor working hard, in the end, you get justice. That makes sense? It, it does. And, and you've seen the process from all sides. What was to you the most memorable case as either a judge, defense attorney or prosecutor? That you've that you've had I've had several high profile cases that are are difficult and um, I defended an attorney who was charged with trafficking of persons that was a really difficult case because he was friends with many of my friends mm -hmm. so it was hard to deal with the dynamics of letting someone down and yet this person was an attorney and felt that they had more knowledge than maybe the other people who were from the outside looking in. And he got a, an extended sentence from the jury because we tried the case in the smaller county mm -hmm. based upon a ruling on a motion to uh, change of venue. And it's been a case that has been difficult because it's one of these cases that people constantly ask, you know, how is this person doing? You know, what would you have done differently, et cetera? And 
in that case, the client being an attorney was essentially like the third counsel at table and kind of trying to dictate the strategy, et cetera. The district attorney's office was extremely well prepared with all the evidence that they had. And when he was found guilty, it was a difficult thing. That's tough. And and that case got transferred. Was it Atascosa County? Wilson. Wilson County. And so Wilson County, um, and I use that case in one of my uh, judicial politics classes to talk about the dynamics of jurors. And so the dynamics in jurors um, in Wilson County were very different than the ones in Bear County because you, there you got a rural county. I think a really large percentage of those that made it on the jury or those that would be summoned to be on a jury would be farmers, would be ranchers, uh, would be individuals that worked in more agrarian type uh, employment, right? There were also a lot of people who had left San Antonio because they didn't like how the city was growing. Right. So yeah, so you had people that had a persuasion that maybe uh, was not positive towards the big urban type community. And and selecting a jury was very, very difficult for the defense. Once they heard the title of the case, it was essentially game over. Yes. And we had some tremendous restrictions placed on us of what topics we could not discuss during jury selection, which also made it difficult, especially when that first juror fainted on day one in viewing some of the videos that we wanted to discuss, but we were not allowed to broach the subject. Yeah, that'd be a very challenging type case under those circumstances. You were a judge in a family violence court, in a county court at law that was completely dedicated to handling family violence cases. So you had a really huge caseload. Correct. What was it like to work as a judge in that kind of court? It was fast and furious. Yeah? It was very fast and furious. It was the only court at the time that was designated until it split up into County Court 13. And then yeah. during the pandemic, the cases were spread out and then there's impact court. So there's a lot of resources now to tackle that issue. But at the time, it was pretty fast and furious. We had a, a lot of resources put into that court and I was able to write a grant to help get additional resources for that. And that's what I was thinking. Because you were the only court at that time that handled those kind of cases, you probably had to develop a lot of a lot of forward thinking procedures that we use now, right? You probably had to come up with a lot of the things that are involved in that and those types of cases now. Well, I don't want to take credit for the stuff that other people have done. Um, I think that I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by people and agencies that had ideas that we would just try to see what worked and what didn't work. How how is it that the idea and and for folks that don't know. We have specifically dedicated family violence courts and the county courts at law. How is it that it came about that your court, the court that you worked in, was the only court that handled those kind of cases in the entire county? I believe it was designated that when the county was a little smaller. Mm -hmm. And maybe the issue wasn't as prevalent where there was more of an eye from the law enforcement to realize that, you know, even a woman can be an assaulter or if somebody is saying, no, I want to drop charges now, and but they see evidence that's contrary, maybe back then they didn't really arrest people. But then now with the new procedures that different administrations have implemented, do a further investigation, talk to neighbors, talk to children, look for injuries that may not have resulted in an arrest back then, but now do a result in arrest and prosecution now. So it's 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 always an evolution in in our laws. So the county has grown so fast. Um, do you think that maybe uh, those types of cases should be spread around a little more amongst the court, which is what the courts is doing? Uh, the courts are doing that. But do you think that um, there's a different way to handle those kind of cases now? Well, you know, I I do commend that back when we were doing this, that there was a lot of specialized training for the prosecution. There were also trainings available for the defense and people would embrace that and try to get an additional knowledge and and kind of learn to identify what are problematic and what isn't. Uh -huh. um, however, again, everything is evolutionary where something may not have been a problem. It essentially became more to light, so uh -huh. to speak, in the county as even with the Me Too movement where people are like taking things much more seriously. It's like, oh, well, you know, you just did that so you could get ahead as opposed to, oh, my God, you were a victim. Right. And I've learned that as well in cases, et cetera, is that there's a certain awareness at, that needs to be recognized that 
you know, this is in fact a problem or this is not a problem and let me tell you why. Right. So, so you're a cell practitioner, right? I am. Which means you have your own business. I do. And which is impressive. And, and, um, having your own business, attorneys that are cell practitioners have what are considered to be very high rates of, uh, depression and suicide and all these other issues that relate to folks that are under tremendous pressures. You seem to handle things very well, having your own practice. What are some of the things that you do to relax, to enjoy yourself, to unwind? I believe I'm very family oriented. Uh -huh. And I, I do spend a lot of time with family and my friends. I try to make it a routine to be able to see my friends regularly whether it's coming to court and coming in and saying hi to certain people that are in court mm -hmm. or outside of court, you know, having dinner early for my aging friends mm -hmm. or just to be able to spend time with my family. I think that's very important to have that diversion that you don't take in everything that you get and think that people automatically are terrible people. Because I think as a general rule, most people are good people and they really want to help you mm -hmm. and most people are very encouraging that, you know, they don't want to see you fail and they don't want to see you suffer. Right. And it's important to surround yourself with people who are positive like that. And also to be able to identify when other people, I believe, are suffering or internalizing things that they need to talk about and being that friend that listens to others. That's so about relationships and finding support. I think that's the majority of it. And being supportive. Correct. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. Really, we should talk more often. I agree. And and I always enjoy seeing you in the court. But well, we've reached the end of the episode. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I really enjoyed today's conversation. Please make sure to ask any questions that you desire on the website. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. You've been listening to Beyond the Gavel with Judge Ron Ranghill. Join us in the next two weeks where we are educating the public and expanding mindsets. Head to our website, beyondthegavelpodcast.com, or your favorite podcast platform to subscribe to the latest episodes and updates.